Good morning, clinicians. This is James Brinton, speech pathologist. Thank you so much for joining us for my online presentation of what SLPs need to know for eye gaze AAC axis with less than perfect eyes. This presentation was developed uh, by myself and Nancy Cleveland, our medical director, who's been working with eye gaze patients for over three, uh, three decades. So let's jump right in. Our company is iGaze Incorporated. We've been known for a long time as LC Technologies, but we changed our name and logo last year, and it's nice to meet you. This webinar will be about 20 to 25 minutes. Because this is a recorded presentation, there's no Q&A, but I invite you to reach out to us at 1-800-iGaze or my email directly for questions. Companion documents are available via email. There are three main things I would love to cover. First, how does eye tracking work? And then what do we mean by less than perfect eyes? These fall into three categories. We have atypical form or anatomy, atypical or asymmetrical eye movement, and atypical circumstances, things outside of the person's eyes. And then what can we do in these atypical cases for success with eye gaze AAC? I am a clinician that's been working with Eye Gaze Incorporated for the last four years. So I've been working primarily with the Eye Gaze Edge with children and adults. However, I have worked with other adults and children with different eye, eye tracking devices. The images and content that you have here before you will be focused more on what data that we've collected from the Eye Gaze Edge, including uh, eye images. But I also hope that each of us can generalize these underlying uh, principles to eye tracking assessment, no matter what device we have in our clinics or what device a patient may come to us with. So let's cover the basics. These are eye conditions that we see most often with adults uh, who need eye tracking assessment. We have dry eyes, we have goopy eyes, nystagmus, strabismus, medriasis, cataracts, and contact lenses. As I mentioned, the, there will be several eye images shown today, and Eye Gaze Incorporated, Incorporated has collected over the last three decades various eye images, typical eye images, atypical eye images. Our philosophy has been collect feedback, collect data, and change our product to meet the needs of Eye Gaze users. So many people have come to us not being able to operate any eye tracking communication device and asked our medical team and engineers to design something that would work for their unique, medically uh, complex eyeball. These images that we've collected over the three decades are, are analyzed and improvements are made to our image processing software. And in my opinion, that's one reason why the eye gaze edge is known for not only high accuracy, but being a device that works when no other devices seem to work. Our engineers have really worked on our software to allow it to work for eyes that just fall outside of the norm. Here's a general image of how eye tracking works to conceptualize that, which is sometimes very abstract. So we have the eye tracking system and the eye gaze camera at the bottom, which shines an LED up at the person's eyeball. Meanwhile, that person's eye is pointed somewhere at the screen and the screen and the camera are fixed to, to each other. As the camera is flashing an LED light at the eye, it's taking pictures of the eye. Using this uh, triangle that we see here, basically it all comes down to math. This triangle of the light pointing at the person's eye and then coming back down to the camera allows this image processing software to calculate and predict where that person's eye is pointed on the screen. Let's talk a little bit about eye tracking in general, as well as calibration. So eye tracking is a method of determining where someone is looking. And a camera or cameras, depending on the manufacturer of the eye tracking device, take pictures of one or both eyes, and these images are digitized and then analyzed by image processing software to determine the gaze location on the screen. The images you see today are collected from the eye gaze edge, and they demonstrate what's called the pupil center corneal reflection method of eye tracking. It's a pretty big term, so let's break it down. Here's what the camera sees. 
So if we look at this eye image, we see the top of the eyelid, we see the iris, and we see the pupil, which is lit up like a full moon. So what happens, as I showed in the picture before, this eye tracking camera is flashing infrared light in the eye. So that light hits the cornea and goes into the eye, goes through the eye and reflects off the retina, which is in the back of the eye. And it makes that whole pupil light up. That light then travels back outside and goes back down to the camera. So pupil center corneal reflection principle. First, in this image, let's find the pupil center. I have an, an arrow pointed right here. In the center of that pupil is a spot of light. Our image processing software has placed, has superimposed that spot of light on top of the center of the pupil. Here, the second point of light at the bottom right is the corneal reflection, or what we call the glint spot. This is where the light from the camera initially is entering the eye and traveling into the eye. When that light hits the cornea, since the cornea is moist, a bit of light reflects back off of the cornea. These two points of light are absolutely critical for the eye tracking instrument to see and to measure and monitor as that eye moves around. As that eyeball moves around, as it looks at different points on the screen, these two points of light change in relationship to each other. So here we'll notice that Again, the pupil center dot is right in the center of the pupil, and the glint spot on the cornea is at about five o'clock, if that were a clock face. There are, there are a few images that we'll look at after this. You'll notice that these two points of light are in different places in relationship to each other. So again, if the eye tracking camera sees these points of light, it can predict where the eye is pointed. If for some reason, we'll talk about this in more detail, if for some reason the camera cannot find and track these two points of light, that's when we run into difficulty. Calibration. Before somebody uses an eye tracking device, they need to get calibrated. Calibration is the process of mapping the radius of curvature of that person's eyeball and mapping where the center of their macula is on the retina. The camera needs to scan a smooth curved surface of the cornea in order for accurate eye tracking. So if this person does not have a smooth curved surface or a surface that is dirty on their cornea, it's gonna be problematic. We'll talk about that too. I really like this image because you can see the, the curve of the eye. Many of us assume that eyeballs are round like marbles when in fact they are not. They have curves, some of us have astigmatism where the eye is shaped uh, asymmetrically. So again, the camera has to measure and map out the specific curvature of that individual's eyeball in order for it to be accurate. That's why uh, my calibration probably will not work very well for another person. My eyes are different than your eyes. All right, let's jump into some eye images of atypical eyes. Notice here what we mentioned in the previous eye image a few slides back where there were two points of light, one in the pupil center and a glint spot on the cornea. You'll notice in this eye image, the pupil is lit up like a full moon. However, those two points of light are absent. This is an image of what a dry eye might look like. Dry eyes are typically caused by insufficient tear production. We have to realize that tear production decreases after the age of 40, even in typical, uh, typical eyes. This causes the corneal surface to become dry and because that corneal surface is dry, light is not being reflected back off of that cornea and the camera cannot find the pupil center. So those two points of light are missing. The solution here is to discuss the use of artificial tears. Now, because I work for Eye Gaze Incorporated, I'm no longer an evaluating SLP, but my role is to work with many clinicians and evaluation centers in helping facilitate evaluations. When I'm arranging, uh, an evaluation and helping a, a client get to a clinician, I have certain screening questions. And one of them is I ask, do you ever experience dry eyes? Um, now this would be an appropriate question for our, our adults who know this or who can answer, but sometimes children we may be unaware or they're not able to answer for themselves. So we just do the best we can. If we were addressing an adult, I'd say, do you ever experience dry eyes? Some people know that they may have dry eyes and they can say yes right away. However, some people say no, no, never. And they may be unaware that their eyes actually are dry. 
We work with a lot of folks who have been diagnosed with ALS, and I've found that it is a safe assumption that many, a majority of people with ALS who come to us needing eye tracking access do experience dry eyes. So I ask them, do you ever use over-the-counter or prescription eye drops? Many people say, oh yes, we do have eye drops we can use. Or yes, the doctor has prescribed eye drops because one of the side, side effects of X medication is dry eyes. So I say, great, please use those eye drops before we meet and bring them with you to our meeting. This image here, like I mentioned, is from the Eye Gaze Edge. The Eye Gaze Edge has an image of that person's eye or eyes on every screen. So we can collect this data and clinicians and caregivers and the user can see the condition informally of their own eye at all times. If you're using a Toby Dynavox device, Cranky Romic, Talk to Me Technologies, or iTech Digital device, you may not have this uh, specific visual feedback, but these principles still remain the same. If you can ask about dry eyes and try and prevent them uh, during your evaluation time, most likely it will help you. When eye drops are administered, uh, me as the outside clinician, it's not appropriate for me to administer eye drops. The person I, I ask them if they can bring their eye drops and either the, the caregiver, the spouse, or the nurse can administer them uh, as appropriate, just as they would at home. Next, what we see sometimes is something we've termed goopy eyes. Looking at this image, we see across the pupil, again, the pupil's lit up like a full moon, we see some, some splotches or streaks. And again, we notice that those two points of light that the camera must see in order to accurately eye track are missing. Goopy eyes are typically caused by a reduced blink rate. It causes congealed tears not to wash away. They remain on the cornea, leaving the corneal surface not smooth. So there are deposits there from tears that have not been washed away, brushed away. So the surface of the eye appears streaked or blotchy. It may look like a polka dot on the eye that moves around as they blink or blotches, smears. We'll note the absence of the pupil center tracking that and the glint spot. So I know if I saw this image, there's no way this person will have a good experience with their eye gaze device. So the solution here again is to continue use of artificial tears if you've already brought this into the discussion. This may clear up after one use of artificial tears. It may take several uses. How I instruct people to administer their teardrops is uh, have the spouse or the nurse or whoever's administering them put in the drops, have the individual close their eyes, and then the caregiver gently, very gently, massages the, the eyelid over the cornea. And the um, person can open their eyes, they may take a tissue and, and wipe the base if anything extra moisture has run out of the bottom, and then look at the eye image again. It may take a few repetitions to get that eye image available for eye tracking. Let's talk a little bit about cataracts. Here in these images, we see, looking at the pupil, we see some black spots. The upper image, we have a cataract in both eyes. The one on the right is very small and concentrated. The one on the left is a little bit bigger and has an abnormal border. The one below is more diffuse, has an irregular shaped border, and is larger. So what is a cataract? In our eye, we have the lens, and a cataract is a clouding of that lens. This cataract causes interruption of the infrared light reflection that's needed for eye tracking. Remember, there's infrared light coming from the camera, has to go through the person's glasses, through the person's eye, hit the retina in the back, and then bounce back out to the camera. If there's something in the middle of that that's interrupting that light, that can be problematic. Cataracts can be age-related or medication-related. Now there are several solutions for cataracts. Depending on the size and the shape, the eye gaze screen, the position may be modified so that it uh, doesn't really impact accurate use. They may have a cataract just in the right eye, so can you just track the left eye on the system that they're using? Or a cataract may be surgically removed. So when cataracts come, or if someone says, hey, yes, I do have the beginning of cataracts, Try the eye tracker that you have or that they've come with and just gauge, is this working? Can we change some of these factors to make it work better? Now there's something unique about the eye gaze edge is that our software has accommodation 
for something we're going to talk about next. Let's talk first about cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is known as lens replacement surgery. It's a removal of the clouded lens. And the doctor will, will insert through the cornea a, a new artificial lens into that eye. The surgery is popular and highly effective. The only problem at times is for someone who is an eye gaze user, either AAC communicator or computer access with eye gaze, when the doctor places that artificial lens in the eye, it may cause an additional artificial reflection, an artificial glint spot or point of light. And I have that pictured here. So the solution for some people is using a system that has artificial lens correction software like the eye gaze edge. It's never a guarantee though that they will benefit from this or that they absolutely need it turned on if they've had cataracts removed. Again, if somebody's had cataracts removed, you try it and you see what their accuracy is and how their surgery has impacted their use. Okay, so this top image is an eye. They've had the cataract removed and an artificial lens placed in it. The caption here says there's no eye tracking gnat visible in the pupil center. So yes, we see two points of light on this eye, but neither one of them is the pupil center. Remember that eye trackers use the pupil center corneal reflection method to calculate their math. So here we're seeing two glint spots. One's a real glint spot and one's a fake glint spot from that artificial lens. So our engineered solution here, we have the artificial lens correction turned on in our software. Now the pupil center is visible. We see two outside points of light here. One is the real glint spot on the cornea and one is the artificial glint spot that's coming off of that artificial lens. Our software is telling the camera to ignore the artificial glint spot and just track the, the real glint spot and the true pupil center. So here, this bottom image is someone who's had that accommodation turned on in the software and they can once again accurately use the eye gaze edge eye tracker without interference. So again, cataracts are a little bit more complex. See how it's impacting the person and then modify factors as needed. Let's talk a little bit about contact lenses. You know, I really love this eye image. This image is from Google. This is not from the eye gaze edge. What I like about this eye image is you can see, clearly see that contact lens sitting right on top of the cornea. For people who wear contact lenses, the contact surface becomes, in essence, the surface of the cornea. Remember we said at the beginning that the cornea needs to be smooth and moist and clean and clear because that eye tracker is scanning that smooth surface of the cornea to understand the unique curvature of that person's eye. So that contact, just like eyeglasses, if someone's wearing eyeglasses, the lenses have to be clean. It needs to be clean and smooth. If somebody wears daily contact lenses, that may not be a problem because they're fresh lenses up that morning. If somebody's using hard contact lenses, they have to be upkeeping their contact lens hygiene pretty well. They'll notice as they're using eye tracking, when they blink, the contact lens on the surface of the cornea may move around a bit before becoming stationary into a resting spot. So they may notice a sh slight shift in accuracy. However, it, it's, uh, definitely usable still. I found that many people who are eye gaze users will tend to use their glasses instead of preferring to use their contact lenses. I think this may be more due to often these people are having to have somebody insert their contact lenses. Um, it's just easier to put glasses on for many people. However, you may, you yourself may wear contact lenses and you're trying out eye gaze systems and you'll notice oh, you know, I'm wearing my contacts and these aren't working very well for me. Um, often contacts can become dry and irritated in the afternoon, I know mine do, and so eye tracking works much better for me if I just refresh my eyes and put my glasses on, take my contacts out. But eye gaze use with contact lenses is often successful if the contact is clean and clear. Same thing with glasses, we often get the question, do eye gaze systems work with eyeglasses? So, Generally, yes, they work with sunglasses, doesn't matter the tint. They work with single lens visions uh, that are clean. They work with um, bifocals. If in a bifocal lens or a trifocal lens, we have these cut lines in the lens. 
if the light coming from the eye tracking camera is interrupted by these lines in the lens, that can be problematic. So if you position the, the person's uh, device appropriately, so it's either above or below the line without interrupting or crossing that line, that can work. Um, we found people who, anyway, with the eye gaze edge, if they get the progressive bifocals or trifocals, they can use the eye gaze edge very well. So it just uh, depends on what they have, and typically we'll recommend that they go to their doctor and get a prescription for the progressive lenses if indeed they do want to wear their bifocals or trifocals. A few other eye conditions pictured here. So first, uh, nystagmus is not pictured here. Nystagmus is a rapid involuntary movement of the eyes. You may be able to notice this when you look at that person's eyes or may not. It just depends on how it's manifest. Strabismus, both eyes cannot gaze at one point, conjugate on one point together. In layman's terms, this can be called lazy eye sometimes. The image on the left here, this child has one eye that is facing straight forward and the other eye has strabismus, it's pointed inward. And then we have medriasis. Medriasis is an abnormal dilation of the pupil. This image on the right, the boy's right eye, our left, is abnormally dilated open. So that's an example of what medriasis might look like. Um, the eye gaze edge, I, I can't speak to other systems, but I will speak to uh, the eye gaze edge. And again, that's the beauty of when you are evaluating patients with eye gaze devices is if we allow them to experience different technologies, different cameras and softwares, we can find and match up uh, the software that's best suited for that person's unique medical conditions. No eye tracker is perfect. And that's why we want to have them try as much as we can. We can collect solid data to provide a thorough evaluation for them. Nystagmus, I know that uh, our, our software can accommodate a certain degree of nystagmus. Uh, same with strabismus. Our eye gaze edge has been designed from its inception to track the movement of just one eye. Um, medriasis, we have software compensation for abnormally small and large pupils. Again, it's not perfect, but sometimes it will catch an outlier who cannot use any other eye tracking technology. Uh, abnormal pupil size here on the left, we have a pupil that is abnormally small. We look at that eye image and we're looking for the pupil center and the, the glint spot. And again, it's not, not there. This, this image is, uh, the pupil is just too small. The image on the right, we have ptosis of the eyelids, drooping eyelids. Um, the eye gaze edge again has software compensation for that. Let's talk a little bit more about strabismus. There is something called alternating strabismus where not one eye is always dominant. Depending on where that person is looking in the visual field, one eye may be more domi dominant than the other on the right side or the left side, up or down. For users with alternating strabismus, what we found works in many cases is to give that person a nasal side patch on the less dominant eye. So we may be able to find out which eye is more dominant. So in this example, this person's right eye is the more dominant one. So on the left eye, we put a partial nasal side patch and we track just the right eye. This partial nasal side patch, we've seen at times, forces the eye that's available to become more dominant in more of the visual field. It's a strategy you have to play around with and individualize depending on the eyeballs that are in front of you. Our medical team at iGaze Inc. is happy to help field any questions or troubleshoot any tricky cases, no matter what device you may be using with the person. So feel free to give us a call at 1-800-EYEGAZE and we can help walk you through some of these tricky scenarios. Our job as clinicians and evaluators is to be curious about the client's eye condition and function as they gaze to communicate as well as understand different device features and different device limitations. One of the screening questions we ask is we find out if this person can of their own volition look up, look down, look left, right, and straight ahead. Let's talk a little bit about evidence-based practice. There was an article from the ASHA Perspectives magazine in August of 2018 called Eye Gaze 101 what SLPs should know about selecting eye gaze AAC systems. This quote here stood out to me. 
It said best practice is to trial multiple devices with patients so therapists and end users can make informed choices and evidence-based recommendations. In my travels across the country, I've seen some clinics that truly do robust and thorough data collection with multiple devices when a client comes to them with eye tracking needs. On the flip side, I've seen other clinics that say, you know what, if you have this diagnosis, this is the device you get. And that device may not work perfectly for everybody. So it's really important that we allow patients, just as if they were buying a car, to try out different models, allowing us to collect data, allowing them to have input, and finding uh, hardware and software that is tailored to that person's unique medical needs. This next slide is specifically about the iGaze Edge. I am a full-time employee for the iGaze Edge. Um, however, our, our mission statement is to empower all clinicians with information and knowledge that will help them make the best choice for their client, whether it be the iGaze Edge or another device. Some unique features about the iGaze Edge is it is known as a low fatigue, high accuracy device. So it's, our camera has one infrared light that shines on one eye or both eyes. It's low glare, it has low light across all screens. Our iGaze users over the decades have said, please keep the screens dark and low light because it allows us to use it without fatiguing quickly. Our software, as I mentioned, has compensation for many atypical eye conditions, high accuracy. We run the Grid3 software, so that has language options, uh, pre-literacy through adulthood. The patient's eye image is on every screen to monitor key features for accurate eye tracking, not only for the end user, but for the, the clinician, the evaluator, and the caregivers. They're setting the device up every day. Our phone number is 1-800-EYE-GAZE. Our website is eyegaze.com. Please reach out to us with any questions or if you need a demonstration in your region by one of our local representatives. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope to hear from you soon.